Okay, I think we are good to get started. So, um, hello everyone, and um, on behalf of the Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center, I would like to welcome um, everyone for this uh, webinar, which is a uh, part of the foundation's curriculum at the neonatal echocardiography, uh, neonatologist performed echocardiography lecture series. So my name is Purva Deshpande and I'm um, one of the neonatologists at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Um, and I am a member of the education committee um, at the NHRC. Um, this is just a reminder that our panelists today are um, hemodynamics trainees. So um, uh, just a reminder to all the trainees to please turn on your camera so you can interact with our speakers. Um, and if you want to ask questions, you can turn your audio on um, when you're asking questions. You can have your audio off for the rest of the time. Um, this is meant to be an interactive session. Um, but for the audience, uh, please um, enter your questions in the Q&A chat box. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Um, and so I think I'll um, come to the topic of today's lecture, which is uh, standardization of TNA co measurements. And it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today, um, Dr. Amy Stanford and Dr. Rachel Hyland. So um, Amy Stanford is a clinical assistant professor in the division of neonatology at the University of Iowa. She completed her training in neonatology and her neonatal hemodynamic fellowship at the University of Iowa and her research interests are uh, contributors to cardiopulmonary disease amongst convalescing extremely preterm infants as they reach term and post-term post-menstrual age. Um, Dr. Rachel Hyland is a neonatal hemodynamics fellow in the division of neonatology um, as well at the University of Iowa. She completed her neonatology fellowship at Washington University at St. Louis. Um, so over to you, Amy and Rachel. Thank you so much, Pora. Um, so today's lecture really is going to be a very practical one, hopefully, but hopefully helpful to all of us as trainees. Um, I just joined the hemodynamics team this summer as a fellow and I've quickly learned how important it is to have accurate and very replicable measurements. Um, so this lecture is meant to be kind of a review of the hemodynamic measurements that we all routinely obtain. Um, so again, we're gonna be focusing not so much on obtaining images today as that's been covered in other excellent lectures that you have access to, but um, again, measurement specifically, and hopefully we'll have some tips along the way, um, as well as some things that could help you obtain these correctly. Um, we'll try to make it as interactive as possible. So please um, stop us to ask questions and try to interact with us if you can on the questions we have throughout for you, please. I have no disclosures, um, but to start, I'd like to really thank the hemodynamics team here at Iowa that's been so generous in their teaching um, and sharing of resources, and also specific thanks to Dr. Bishop, who uh, made kind of one of the references that I've been really heavily referring to, and then to Dr. Lauren Ruiz um, at Winnie Palmer in Florida, who helped with the links on the slides for this slide deck, and of course to Dr. Stanford, who's here um, giving the talk with me, and will also answer any of the difficult questions. Um, so to start with today, we're just going to spend a little bit of time talking about the importance of standardizing measurements in our field. Um, I'll show you a brief example of some of the TN echo screening and scanning protocols here at Iowa. But again, the bulk of our time, we'll kind of walk through the Iowa protocol and examine key measurements that we all are attaining and common mistakes or areas for optimization. So standardization just generally as a process obviously is very long standing. I think we all think of it um, just really in technical or high risk fields like in aviation or in military, but in health clear, there's been probably increasing realization of the benefits of standardization, particularly at the public health and international levels. Um, the WHO has made it a large part of their worldwide initiatives. And we realize, you know, in clinical medicine, there's a really wide amount of variability in individual patients. There are numerous studies that show that um, supporting process standardization can really improve actually individual patient care. And the goals are multiple, but I think for our field and hemodynamics in particular, 
I think the benefits to efficiency for one are pretty obvious. And I hope that as well, the, the plan and the goal to minimize mistakes. Um, and then I think as hemodynamics continues to develop and new programs are opening, we also hope that using kind of a standardized method of obtaining images and performing measurements allows future programs and generations to build on the hard work um, and process development that's been attained by all of these prior programs that have started. Um, we all know we see further standing on the shoulders of those that come before us. So. Um, I think another aspect that's really important to have standard repeatable measurements is when we're trying to communicate. So not just between different programs across the country, across the world, but also within our own systems. And then finally, as the field continues to grow, it will be really, really critical as we collaborate more and more with each other in um, research avenues to investigate and improve the outcomes for our patients. So, um, I've included the screening protocol that we use here at Iowa, and which isn't really the focus of this talk, but I think, again, having a standardized way just to think about approaching as you build a program is really important to make sure we're not missing babies that deserve scans and to optimally benefit as well any of those patients that would benefit from hemodynamics. So at Iowa, our protocols um, include automatic um, hemodynamics consults for any baby less than 30 weeks. And depending on their gestational age or how their first screening echo, either within like 18 hours or within the first week sooner if clinically needed. And then we have a follow-up protocol for um, chronic pulmonary hypertension screening for all of these babies that will capture them again around eight weeks or 36 weeks corrected, whichever comes first. And this protocol, I know it's very small, not meant for you to read right now, but this is available on the NHRC website. And this is um, the protocol we follow in all of our scans here at Iowa. There's a couple extra measurements we do when we're assessing a baby for the very first time. Um, but again, what we're gonna be going through will be following this protocol, basically in the order that you see here. Um, and you can look at details um, on the website. So now we're gonna get to the bulk of the talk, looking at the measurements. And we'll do this by view, again, following that protocol you briefly saw. Um, you'll notice though, it kind of, as you, even as you get started, this doesn't follow the same pattern as a typical cardiology echo, but there's been a lot of thought into it, um, keeping in mind like the developmental needs of a premature neonate. Um, for example, we save like the supersternal and subcostal views for the ending part of the scan as those tend to be least well tolerated by the babies. And we also try to just keep in mind um, flow. We try to keep the scans moving very quickly to minimize the time that the babies are undergoing the scan. So we start at the apex and we look at measurements um, for the pulmonary veins, the mitral valve, the aortic outflow tract, and the tricuspid in this view. And I'm just gonna put one disclaimer here at the beginning, but you'll see this through multiple views. Anytime that you see the tricuspid valve in any um, window or, or scan that you're looking at, you should assess it and interrogate it for regurgitation and do a continuous wave bridge it. That's our one disclaimer, we'll keep coming up. Um, so the first measurement we'll review is the tracing of the pulmonary vein, again, from the apical four chamber view. Um, usually, like you can see here, there'll be a five, uh, five with a systolic S wave and a S wave and a diastolic D wave. Um, sometimes, though, you'll see a triphasic flow with an S S D, and in that case, you want to measure the higher of the two S waves. And to do this measurement itself, um, you can look with the hash line, look for the start of the QRS, the S should follow just after. And you should be marking the peak velocity of that S wave and the D wave at the moment of the highest velocity, so at the peak of the wave. Sometimes you'll see an A wave um, present, which is showing um, atrial reversal. And this can be normal. It can also be marker of LA hypertension. Um, but just to note, this is only present in some scans. And it's only actually a real A wave if you actually see the D wave coming back all the way to the baseline and then slow going after. Um, so like the kind of shadowy stuff you see in the main picture. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, but this is not representing an A wave. So here's an example of kind of some different ways this flow can look when you're actually doing it in practice. Um, does anyone have any comments on these or any thoughts on these two different babies on this pulmonary vein flow? You might notice differences like in the D wave, for instance, right off the bat. So on the left, what I'm trying to show here is just kind of lower pulmonary blood flow generally. So you could see that, like for instance, in a baby with pulmonary hypertension, or maybe it could just be a baby like on an oscillator that's a little bit compressed, um, or perhaps maybe the pulmonary veins are dilated. Um, and then on the right, that kind of high D wave, um, when I was taught this year, I was told it should look like a snail. Um, it's a snail sign, because you see the little hump. Can you guys see, can you see the arrow, Amy, when I use it? I don't see your arrow. How about if it's over here? There, now I do, now you can see it. Example. So this is like kind of the front of the snail and this little hump is supposed to be a snail. 
I don't know, you can take that or leave it. But when you see that sign, it's kind of higher velocity and a higher D wave, that can sometimes be a marker of like a hemodynamically significant PEA. Okay, here's another one um, I want someone to maybe interact with if possible. Where would you pick? This is like not textbook, obviously, but this is sometimes what you see when you Doppler here. And this is what you get, especially if the baby's angry or kind of moving around, you have to keep moving quickly. Um, where might you think of a spot or what kind of things are you thinking when you look at this when you're trying to figure out where to pick your S and D wave? Perhaps someone would comment like what beat they would choose to measure their S and D wave. You think that, like, how about this one? What about between this one and this one, this one? Oh, wait, you can't see my mouse. Or what are you thinking about? So when I look at an image like, or maybe Amy, if you want to talk through kind of what you think about when you look through an image like this and, and why the person reviewing this one might have picked these two. Yeah, so kind of the biggest thing that I start to think about when I see a lot of like beat to beat variability is I want to kind of look at the overall pattern and see which pattern is most prevalent. And so for example, kind of that, um, that first beat kind of looks like that second to last beat that um, Rachel is pointing out. And then you kind of have those two in the middle that are starting to look similar. And so sometimes when you can't really pick a predominant one, what you can do is, um, which Rachel will talk about, I'm sure later on too, is you can always measure three different beats and average them. Um, that's what we do for research, but sometimes we need to do that clinically when we don't have a uh, predominant pattern in the Dopplers that we obtained. So I have a quick question on that. So I probably would have picked that first one, Rachel, just because it looked like a cleaner envelope. Do you pick, Amy, do you pick the other one? It's not, I guess it's hard to say which one's the most predominant, but because it seems like it's the higher velocity, or how do you, when you have that, where you're not really sure which one and maybe you didn't average it out, I, I probably would have gone with the one that looked like a cleaner envelope, but maybe that's not the correct way to do that. I agree, Lauren, with what you just said. I would probably also, if I was just gonna pick one, would have done that first one, because like you said, it's a clean envelope. The other um, key piece too is, you know, anyone who's, obtained images knows that sometimes maybe you've moved slightly while you're obtaining that Doppler. And so usually the most accurate representation is some of those first few beats. So um, I clinically and research, well, clinically, I would have probably picked those first ones. Um, also, you can kind of just look at the overall average for them and see, you know, yes, that one with the two is maybe a little bit higher than a few of the others. So I will be very honest, this is a challenging one to measure. And so I, you can either do just the first beat or doing all like averaging of three. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the mitral valve um, where we look at kind of LV filling. So E for the early filling pre-atrial contraction and then the A for atrial filling. Um, here you also are selecting peak velocity like you just did for your pulmonary um, S and D. And this example I think is pretty typical probably for a term baby. Um, in the very preterm babies, you often will see a smaller E and then a larger A as the premature heart can be quite stiff um, and the pressure gradient is less, so less passive early filling, but an exception can be in those with a hemodynamically significant PDA. Um, in any case, this is a fairly easy um, measurement to do in this example. It's very clear, very clean, and a very tight envelope. But sometimes um, the mitral E to A can look sort of fused. This can often happen when the baby's really tachycardic. So troubleshoot your image first. Make sure that you're really at the exact right point at the tip of the mitral valve leaflets. You can come back later when the baby's more calm. Uh, another thing that you can try, though, is when we do this on multiple views, this will come up again. Try to spread out the horizontal sweep as you're measuring. Just spread out the image, and you can kind of look for that dark darker flow pattern below um, to help you estimate where the value should be. And here's an example, again, that's really not textbook. And what beat might someone in the line pick or some thoughts that you have on this variability?
Florian, are you going to answer for us? Looks like you unmuted. Thank you. No. Okay. I will walk through Rachel. Oh, uh, someone said average of three baits. Yep, yeah. you could do that. You can definitely do that. Um, but again, if you also kind of just look, the first three beats all look pretty this, much the same. The you know fourth and fifth kind of are similar, but then you also see that sixth. So it looks like the predominant kind of pattern is what we see in those first three beats. So measuring those uh, that first beat, like Rachel has shown there, is what I would do. Yeah. And like Amy had mentioned um, in the last image and, and Lauren brought up as well, like the first beat and this one, especially like you get yourself really well aligned right when you click your Doppler button and then the baby might move a little bit. So often your first beats tend to be the best. Okay, we're going to keep moving along um, for isovolumetric relax relaxation time. And this is obtained kind of four chamber into almost apical five because um, you're seeing ejection below the line and then filling above. Um, and this time measurement can be tricky if there's kind of extra fluff in the picture. And this is another one, um, especially in this view, every time I'll elongate the, the baseline so I can uh, make sure to accurately measure because a really common mistake can be to end the IVRT too late. You need to end it as soon as the mitral valve opens. So as soon as that slope starts to increase, it's really important to make sure you're being really tight with this measurement. And then when we move into fully the apical five, we do a narrowed apical five chamber view um, to get the really well aligned outflow track so you can be really accurate in your LVO assessment. Um, and this first part of the measurement is the first part of the calculation for the LVO. So we're getting the VTI and the heart rate first. Um, you start your measurement at the beginning of ejection time, that's at point A here, and you have to really tightly trace that envelope um, all the way around ejection back to point B, and then you can scroll over to point C at the very beginning of the next ejection to obtain heart rate they'll be used in the calculation. And again, um, in some babies, especially in the RVO VTA, which we'll get to in a little bit, there can be some extra fluff at the end. So it can be really helpful sometimes to even use the flow that's kind of above the line that I pointed out here um, to show kind of where that valve is closing and make sure that you stop um, your um, tracing here. And not even if there was like, maybe there's a little fluff here, this would not count within your BTI. So really important to be very tight with this measurement. Um, Amy and Rachel, can you guys comment on how you choose what's fluff and you don't want to count it in and how you choose what's actually the envelope. Because I, when I first started doing this and still doing it, I get feedback that I'm not tight enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so wondering if you guys have tricks on what parts you say, oh, this is fluff and I can kind of go put my line right through that. I think, um, oh, go ahead, Amy. I was just going to comment on using kind of that, like kind of that last tip is helpful for me because sometimes you'll even see like pretty bright white, like all the way out here and it is confusing. So it looks like it should be part of that same envelope, but you'll often still get a pretty high, like bright line here that's showing where the valve is closing that you can use that to just exactly cut off right where you get to that, that point at the, the flow above the line. And from the beginning, side of the envelope, I'm kind of looking at how thick or thin this line is down here. So here's that dark lemon or flow is a really thin line here and this is black. So this is a really narrow point. So you can even go like right here and then just follow that really tightly up is what I kind of do. Yeah, I think um, the other thing I can add is, you know, trying to follow that envelope, um, especially when you will talk about in the RV, um, the RVO, and when you have a hemodynamically significant PDA, you can get a lot of that turbulent flow. And so really trying to follow that nice laminar flow with the, that you're seeing with the black there mm -hmm. and kind of um, trying to trace around that as much as possible. I think we might have some examples in the RVO that kind of can show that a little bit um, to those of who are visual learners. Okay, so next we move into our apical two chamber. So this view, in addition to the standard four chamber that we started with at the beginning of the scan are used together to measure ejection fraction by Simpson fly plane. Um, and the line we're tracing here again is the endocardium or the inside of the cavity. 
So don't get confused when you're looking through these um, on like tracing out here, the pericardium, you really wanna be inside the very inside of the cavity. And we'll show some examples of that. Um, so again, when we do this measurement, we're tracing the endocardium both at systole, the end systole, the smallest cavity volume, and end diastole, the largest cavity volume. And to make sure that you're exactly in the right plane and point, you have to make sure that that valve on the top is closed. So it'll start to kind of tilt down, but make sure you're measuring right when it's very closed and, and, and um, at this point. Um, so some tips that we found are helpful for this. I'm moving really slowly frame by frame back and forth to kind of follow those kind of shades of gray. They look like little bubbles to me almost when I'm like on the right line. Um, you see there's like some bubbly looking stuff that kind of helps me follow um, the line that I'm supposed to for this tract. But um, as an example and for some practice, I'll just have you kind of hopefully you're able to look at the screen and kind of visualize and think to yourself um, where you might pick. I'm going to show you some examples of some different lines that you might select based on how your eye is capturing that gray. So keep looking at these lines as we go back and forth. If anyone would like to tell me a line, that would be great. Otherwise, we'll just move forward and I'll show you the lines we picked. But again, look at these. I think this one in particular, you could get a little bit off looking at, oh, it looks like there's maybe bubbles this way. There's maybe some line this way and then this line out here, which is the correct one. Anyone have thoughts? Okay. So in this one, um, I think a helpful thing to do is follow really closely that this sort of myocardium length should be about even on both sides. So even there's like a bright point here, this actually line, you can't see my arrow, sorry. This line um, helps you follow um, the same thickness that's on the opposite side of the heart. And then you're also thinking about taking that line all the way out to the edge of the valve. So B would be correct for the systolic line. And then I think A and B are pretty clear for the diastolic line. Again, just don't get um, confused and go way out to the pericardium. You're supposed to be on the inside of the cavity. I think tracing Simpsons is one of, there's a few things that we'll talk about through this. You know, I think this is one of the hard things to learn how to do um, and learning how to see like shades of gray. But like Rachel said, the biggest tip is making sure that the muscle thickness is equal throughout and that can kind of help guide you correctly. But do not worry if you struggle with that. It is a challenging one to do. Yeah. Just to echo that, the people that have worked with me and are training me can speak to this. Drawing shapes going back into kindergarten is one of the hardest things I've had to do as a trainee through this. And I, is, even though it has said multiple times, it really didn't click the shapes and the shades of gray until it really got hammered into my head that they need to be the same thickness. And once I figured that out, I could find an area that looked more clear to me and make sure I knew how thick that was. And then if I lost another part of the wall, I at least knew how thick one side was so that the other side was supposed to be the same. And I think that really helped me, but I'm still um, still learning how to draw shapes. <laughs> yeah. Ongoing, part of hemodynamics. Um, just briefly, I'll mention that um, in the apical three chamber, this is kind of your backup view as well. If your LVO isn't very well, well aligned in the five chamber, this can be a spot as well that you can do a pulse wave and get your um, outflow, your LVO. Um, and you can also use this view. It'll be part of your global strain calculation. Um, for tissue Doppler imaging, um, we're looking at an S prime and an E prime for measurements on the LV free wall and the septum, and then an S prime on the RV free wall. Um, we do obtain some additional um, TDIs in our protocol for research, but as of now, aren't using those for clinical purposes. Um, I think just key things to know for this, the S prime really needs to be the most robust peak above the line, and the E prime is the first of kind of two quite clear, well-differentiated peaks below the line. Um, so if you're only able to see one lower peak, then these are likely fused and you can't report an EDE prime there. Here's just an example of that again and showing you that while there are kind of maybe two peaks, you're sort of looking for the most robust sort of widest peak above. Here's another example for everyone to look at together. Um, there's probably lots of options, lots of places where you could pick um, for your S prime and E prime. Anyone have thoughts first for the S prime where you might select one through four? So I guess one for me to do this, I would probably do the horizontal sweep and make it wider. 
um, mm -hmm. which I don't know if Amy, if you feel like that makes it harder in these views. I don't think you guys have directly said that to me, but sometimes if I think I see an E prime, but want it to get separated a little bit, I'll use that horizontal sweep. Do you ever do that with these? Yeah, yes. For the the E prime um, in particular, can do that like you do with the um, EA on the mitral valve. Um, I do think that's a great tip for especially when it looks like they might be fused on the ED prime or excuse me, the E primes. Not so much for the S prime. Um, what Rema said, the for the S, take the highest peak. Um, so. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Rachel? Yeah, so this one, it can be confusing. So unlike some of the other measurements where we do always want to do the highest peak, um, this one, to be accurate, you actually want the broadest peak. Um, the way that they taught to me to think of it is like pick the broadest mountain of the many mountains. So this is a bad mountain example. So for this one, actually, it's not up here or here. The correct S prime is actually down here. And you can see these are all pretty quite similar. Although they're sort of fluffy, this is still a very like usable measurement because they're all pretty consistent. And you see this sort of broad part of the mountain, part of the mountain here. And again, the E prime is a little more straightforward, the first peak, um, big peak below the line. Um, the TAPSI measurement is pretty straightforward if it's a good measurement. So alignment here, like everywhere, but here too, it's really, really critical. Um, it's also important to make sure that you're following the same line from the very top to top or the very bottom to bottom. Um, and I think the example um, that actually we initially picked for this is a little bit off. You can see this dotted line, I think, might be following a different line. So I kind of redrew for you. But again, one thing that can help you too is to take the TVI off while you're doing the measurement, just to make see like the black and white. You can turn up the color um, so you can see the gain a little bit more clearly. Um, but just be really careful as you're kind of aligning this and then as you're measuring. Um, so moving into the RV3 chamber, this is probably a more unique view to human dynamics, um, but we really like it because it really focuses on and exposes a really broad part of the RV. So we use this view to obtain RV fractional area of change, and that's, uh, that's which is one of several measures we use for RV function, including like the Tapsi and RVS prime. So to obtain the FIC, the way you measure is really similar to what you do for the Simpson biplane. So you trace the RV cavity really tightly in endiastole and end systole. And here, um, again, try not to get confused by other things in the cavity, particularly in the, in the RV, you can look, there can often be trabeculations, particularly along, along the bottom. Um, so ignore those, just try to really tightly follow the RV border and trace um, along and around um, the valves, so the pulmonary and the aortic and the RA, make sure that they're all closed and you're able to tightly trace around them. Um, so the next view for measurements is the parasternal lung, and we obtain quite a lot from this view. Um, another view that, at least for me, has been a more difficult one to optimize, but um, really trying to get everything aligned correctly and stacked is going to be really critical for accurate measurements here. So the first thing that we're going to look at is fractional shortening of the LV. Um, and this measurement is obtained from an MO Doppler. Um, you need to measure the LV internal diameter at both its smallest um, in end systole and its largest in end diastole, and make sure that you're following kind of the lines as you go across an M mode um, to make sure that you're following the same line, both in systole and diastole. And one tip is to kind of use your reference image at the top. Um, you can see that these numbers are going to correspond to the side as well. So you can kind of get an idea if you're really following the correct line. Um, it can be um, that you kind of get off plane a little bit or that you see a cavity behind that you want to make sure that you're, you're measuring accurately to get this diameter. And then we just kind of narrow down into that exact same view and that's how we are going to measure um, the LV outflow tract, um, the aortic valve um, actual diameter. And this, we're gonna talk about this more. I've got some slides that's focused on this a little bit more in the RVOT, but just to bring up at the beginning, it's really important that what we're measuring here is kind of hinge point to hinge point of the valve and not actually like wall to wall of the cavity. So that's a common area for mistake and it will really kind of drastically actually overestimate your outflow if you're not measuring that correctly. So we'll slow that down in the RVOT, but just wanna think about it early on. I will just pause and say that that is in, measuring the annulus with the hinge point to hinge point on both the aorta and the PA 
is probably the hardest thing to learn how to do. And um, I'm sure some of our uh, former fellows can also comment on how challenging that can be. So do not worry if this is something you struggle with, practice and repetition makes it go easier. Absolutely, thanks Amy. Um, and that same exact viewer just in, this is where we're gonna measure the LA to AO in the M mode Doppler. Um, so for these diameters, you actually want to include the anterior wall of both. So note that the AO here in this measure includes the anterior wall into the end of the cavity, and then the LA is gonna include its anterior wall and then the end of the cavity. Um, another pitfall here can be kind of mismeasuring the end of the LA. So there's current coronary sinus sort of right below. Um, make sure you're not including that in the LA diameter, it'll overestimate it. Um, and also we can standardize, we show here how we like to measure it. So measuring the AO at the trough and then LA at the largest diameter at its peak. Um, so you're making sure not to get like either off cycle when you're measuring the LA to AO. Okay, and the RVO VTI is measured just the same way we already talked about the LVO VTI. Um, you can see again how we're really trying to tightly trace ejection and then scrolling across to get the heart rate. Um, and this is an example, we talked about this early about how it can really look like this is very fluffy, right? There's a lot of extra flow over there. Typically that's background from the PDA coming in the outflow tract, but you need to ignore that to properly measure the VTI. Um, and Another side note, the RVO VTI can be obtained either here in the peristernal long or it can be in the peristernal short. Pick the one that looks best aligned on your Doppler. So as you're going through, um, you want this to be your um, value as, as horizontal equal to the valve itself um, that you're capturing. And then you just need to remember that wherever you end up doing your VTI, make sure that you're measuring the outflow track diameter at the same point to the same view. So to answer Lauren's question earlier, you know, how do you figure out not to include the fluff? Um, do you want to just kind of show with your trace with your, um, there you go, Rachel, kind of where you would measure in here? Yeah, and so I would do the same kind of things we've been talking about, try to keep like a same kind of diameter from laminar flow to the outside. So I follow it down here, I would go up, then I would look upwards and look kind of see where this bright marking is here. And I would trace inside here. And then come down. Oops. And then come down. And you can kind of see what I was trying to talk about earlier. You can see that the block, the black envelope there. You know mm -hmm. where it kind of stops. And so you kind of want to get to a point from your peak up to where that black stops, so that you're not including that mm -hmm. fluff that is over to the right of where Rachel's pointer is right now. Yep. So it's kind of line here. So here's where I said we were going to kind of dive deeper into the hinge points because as um, Dr. Stanford said, it's really difficult. Um, so see again that the flow that's actually able to travel through the valve is within the hinge points. So that's actually like the most accurate way to show of what the outflow truly is for the vessel, the RV or the LVO. Um, you'll also, another kind of tip, you'll start to get a little bit of a stall for what sort of normal values are for smaller and larger babies. Generally, the LVOT and RVOT diameters will be pretty similar. Um, if one's going to be different, usually the RVOT is often a little bit larger. But again, just taking practice to like really slowly click through frame by frame the entire valve to kind of see what those um, hinge points are doing and what the valves are doing will be helpful. So it just takes time and practice. Um, this set of images is from Dr. Bishop. I think it's really beautiful. It shows kind of what the valve looks like as it opens and closes. Um, I pointed out again, like the little bright spots when you're trying to measure on that inside right here. And then I've included just here to cal calculate the output. So you're just gonna plug in what we just showed, how to measure the VTI, the heart rate, and then the diameter. So now we're gonna move on to the peristernal short um, for the PVR index, the eccentricity index, and then the RV to LV size. And PVR index is another good one um, to measure with the horizontal sweep elongated for better accuracy. Um, you'll measure at the Doppler of the pulmonary artery kind of just below the valve. And this is one where there can be more even beat to beat variability. So this is a good one to measure, kind of get in the habit of measuring multiple, measure two to three and average them. And again, like Dr. Stanford said, you can do this with any value. Um, and particularly for research, we will do that. Um, but I think in this view, um, often we'll do this more routinely. 
um, just on this slide, we're kind of showing that you'll see kind of as the angle of your PAAT increases, um, that's kind of showing you kind of a marker of increased resistance. So just something to think about. Um, and this is an example of showing to get an accurate measurement. Uh, I think this is a good example of the um, pulse wave Doppler, the um, sample volume kind of being just below the valve where you'd like it. And then showing from this kind of skinny view, if you elongate out, which is what I did in this measurement, um, the baseline, then you can sort of better see where that very peak velocity is. So you're starting um, at the beginning of ejection, measuring over to get the total RV ejection time to the end, and then going back and looking to see where the very first start of that peak is. And that's where you're going to measure backwards to get your PAAT. And we consider this normal with less than four. So now we're going to move on to the eccentricity indices. Um, and this is something that you want to measure in both end systole and end diastole. It's important to measure this at the right time. So um, you want to measure this right after that fish mouth view that we all love to see. Um, you want to go one step deeper and look right at the level of the papillary muscles to be accurate. So some tips for this view, um, it's really important to measure um, the center line for D1. This is the first line you're going to draw. And you want to get an idea of where the very middle of the cavity is of the RV. And again, right, it's kind of hard to see like when you just look at this, but in a live image, you know, you're going to scooch back and forth and open and close it. So you can kind of see where that little hat of the RV um, right in the middle, in the center. That's where you're going to want to start the line of D1 and just draw it uh, perpendicular straight down to the edge of the cavity. And then when you draw in D2 next, um, you want this to be exactly perpendicular to your D1. And something that like truly like literally will hold up a piece of paper or like a post-it like this so, against your screen so that you can make sure that you're measuring exactly at a 90 degree angle. This can be a tricky one too that gets confusing um, to make sure that you're truly following the inside of the cavity. There can be like lots of little lines and it can be a little bit confusing, but use all of the same tips we talked about like throughout the presentation for like your LVO, VTIs and everything else. Like follow the um, cavity over time, move it back and forth to make sure you're in the right plane, try to ignore the trabeculations, learn about shades of gray. Um, it just takes time to practice and make sure that you're in the right place. Um, another tip just to know when you switch to doing your um, end diastole, the LV does move, right? It's like twisting as well. So it's very normal for you to be measuring that, like it's going to be at a completely different angle and that's okay. The RV to LV ratio, it can be surprisingly challenging. Um, and just like in the RV, FAC, and Simpsons, the same thing that we keep repeating, really careful just to measure the cavity itself and not to veer off course. Um, some tips, the RV should look like a hat. Um, that's one thing that we think about when we're trying to be accurate. Um, so this is another one I'd like people just to like kind of look at and think about. There's lots of different potential lines. Um, any of these lines look more correct than the other or perhaps really wrong, like one of them's really wrong. I like the one that's really wrong. That one I can easily tell is really wrong. That's great. Which one's really wrong? <laughs> Including the papillary muscles. Yeah, that's it's not really good. wrong. Yeah, but it is like we said, we want to just include the really dark area. But you need to ignore and like know that it's a circle, find the circle. So um, in this one, I think I picked the orange line. I think this looks most round to me. And the tips I would have, like look at this kind of bright, it's really clear up here and then down here don't get sucked into that little bright line look at these clear little bubbles that go sort of all the way around the outside and makes a nice little circle follow the shades of gray we'll bubbles. say oops sorry rachel Go one ahead. tip for both the lv and the rv is one sometimes if you get too close to the screen it's harder to see so if you kind of like just step back a little bit you know kind of like the same thing for pie when you take a step back you can see it and also, especially for this one, you can turn up, say, the brightness of your image to see if um, you can see it better, or also kind of make sure that the lights are not super bright in the room that you're measuring so that you can really differentiate um, those shades of gray. 
All right, we're gonna do the same thing for the RV. Which of these lines, blue or yellow, looks more correct? And it's hard, right? It's not easy. That's why I put them both on here. So kind of compare between these two images. I let you internally think about it. The yellow line. And again, like this is a tough one, but I think probably the helpful things to think about are looking at the thickness of the septum. And I think right here, it's pretty clear, like this to here to here probably is the thickness of my septum. And you can use that to kind of follow over along the whole um, edge to kind of get you that base of the base of the RV. Okay, we're moving on, we're getting through this. So super sternal is next. Sorry, quick question. Yeah. Um, so Amy, Rachel, sometimes I see where you don't see the complete kind of RV and, but people will still draw the outline of the RV where you think it should be. How do you decide just to scratch it that you're not really able to do it correctly, or you see it enough where you should be able to kind of outline it, or is it just more of a gestalt when you're kind of scrolling through? It's a great question. I think um, for me, I will kind of scrap it when you can't really see the RV at all, you know, sometimes just with the windows that you have, or perhaps it was obtained in the wrong plane. Um, or I'll scrap it all together when potentially you should have made your window wider. And so you're really cutting off a significant portion of the RV. However, if I can see most of it, then I can kind of use a general gestalt to try to estimate what it is. Um, I think also kind of going along those lines is, you know, um, what is the indication for the echo? Are you truly worried? Say you have, you know, pulmonary hypertension and you're worried about um, RV dilation. So then you really want to try your best to get the best image, the best uh, measurement that you can, which you always want to do, but when it makes a lot of, um, it can help quite a bit with the clinical um, impression, then you want to try to get it as hard as much as you can. So in the suprasternal view, um, we're really just kind of assessing flow. You could also do um, pulmonary veins here. This isn't something we do in all the babies as part of our screening echo, though we would look at pulmonary veins in the crab view. Um, but in here, we're going to talk about um, flow in the descending aorta to start. So this measurement is really very simple. You're really just looking at flow and, and measuring the direction, direction, seeing whether it's normal and forward. As in this picture, you can see that there's flow all throughout until the next beat whether the flow is absent between beats or whether the flow is reversed in that descending um, aorta. And we're gonna come back to this again. I'm gonna ask you questions about direction of flow. Let's just put that away, I'm gonna come back. Um, down into the subcost. Oh, one second, Rachel, sorry. This is a re really, really important um, image to get. I know this was not the, the, uh, the, the conversation for this topic, but um, like Rachel has shown over on the right with where to obtain this from, is you really want to make sure that you have your Doppler in the correct place. Because if you are not in the correct place, you can actually miss like reversal of flow in the descending aorta. So while forward and absent flow in the descending aorta are, can, are normal, reversed is always pathological. So just a really big um, disclaimer to how important this is and that you need to obtain that image in the correct plane. Yeah, thanks. How um, much below the duct should the sample be, be placed in this view? Do you want to talk about that, Rachel, or do you want me to? Well, you want to be fully below the duct. And truly, like, you can't see it, sorry, in this picture, but you want to make sure that you can truly see, like, your color flow all the way down as you're obtaining the image. So. Um, I would say as far down as you can that you see clear anatomy still and that you're clearly below the duct. Yeah, so I agree. I think so on this, where this um, sample is, is perfect. If you went down kind of, you can kind of see where the aorta is going down like off the picture, mm -hmm. that angle is not really the best. And so you don't have to strive to get as far away from the duct as possible. Really, if you're just below it, that's actually kind of an ideal place to get it because 
based on how your orientation is, if you put it too far away, you are not um, putting your sample volume with uh, where you're going to have an accurate Doppler. So if it's reversed down very, very below, you know it's reversed. It You can't fake being reversed, but if you have it too far away, you can have it be absent when it's truly reversed. That's a good point. And that's um, another marker of like alignment too, like you've been talking about. Like here you can see like you're a little bit more perpendicular, but when you're lower, you might be more parallel. Um, in the subcostals, really the big thing you wanna do is just measure the size and direction of the ASD or PFO. Um, and then flow in the celiac and SMA like you did for the descending. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, unless it's a really significant ASD, it's um, often hard to get a really clean um, Doppler of the septum just because it's, the septum is moving so much. Um, so usually to get an idea of direction of flow, I'll more rely clicking through um, frame by frame and looking at the color pattern of the Doppler, not so much by the tracing, which can be a little bit inaccurate depending on how perfect you're exactly at the right spot how much the septum is moving um, and, and all those factors. Um, for the measurement itself, um, like all of our measurements of size, you make to make sure you're measuring in 2D. And then again, just watching your color pattern in the, in the um, color image. So the celiac and the SMA Dopplers, um, this is the same that we just reviewed in the aorta. So you're gonna do the value, um, the, the pulse wave Doppler, and you're gonna get a flow pattern like this. Um, does anyone wanna comment or maybe point out um, in order what kind of patterns these are that we're showing? And if it's just, if you just wanna just use the chat feature, you can just say one is this, two is this, three is that. What do we need? One's reverse, two is forward, and the third one is absent. Thank you. Thank you for the participation. I love that. Um, you're exactly right. Excellent job. It does look upside down for the setting, but again, that's just proposition. Fantastic. Reverse, forward, and absent. And then we do the same thing in the brain. We're trying to look at the direction of the MCA. Um, we also will do a full um, screening head ultrasound in all of the premature babies on their first scans. And then we'll check again if there's something that we need to follow up. But for every single scan, um, we do all of these flow Dopplers. Um, so in this baby, in this example, what direction is the flow? I'd call it forward. Nice, yes, that's exactly right. Thanks, Angelica. Okay, we're gonna end with some of the PDA measurements. Um, these can be tricky. It took me a little bit of time to make sure I was really clear on how to measure these. Um, if you have a bi-directional PDA, there's actually three different ways we're additionally gonna measure. So we'll go through these um, one by one. First thing to do is measure the actual size of PDA, just like we talked about in the PFO or ASD, and make sure that you do the actual measurement itself in 2D. Typically we'll do this at the sort of most narrow diameter with the highest flow, that portion. And you can, as you're obtaining the image, this is a key thing too for obtaining images, but making sure that you're really finding a good spot that your person who's doing measurement, probably gonna be future you, um, has a good spot to measure. And then we characterize the flow itself um, if the shunt is all left to right. And here you can see we're differenti differentiating both by velocity and by pattern. So in this left column, um, we're looking at all pulsatile flow where the peak velocity up here to the minimum velocity is at least two times peak to trough. And then on um, the right column, if we're at less than that, then we would call this a continuous flow pattern as opposed to pulsatile. And then um, in the rows, the top and bottom row, you can see a difference in the velocity of flow. So we either characterize it as kind of a low or a high velocity, and we use about two meters per second as that cutoff. And then for those um, babies that have a pulsatile PDA, you can report the Vmax by just clicking at the very top um, with your caliper to report um, Vmax in meters per second. And then the bi-directional PDAs, as I said, are a little bit more tricky. So we're reporting multiple things to characterize these correctly. So we characterize the flow that's right to left versus left to right by time and by VTI in this picture. And then we're gonna show one more way in the next. So to get these measurements, you need to really tightly trace the envelope above and that's shown here and I didn't show, but then you'd also tightly trace separately the envelope below. Um, and then you can use the formulas I showed on here to show the percentage by VTI and by time. And then the final measure for a bidirectional um, is the percentage of time right to left in systole. 
So for this, you actually need two measurements. The first thing you have to do is to obtain actually just the duration of systole. And the way to do this is to go back a few uh, measurements and to look at um, a recent Doppler of the aorta that hopefully has a similar heart rate to what you're gonna be using for your PDA measurement. So you're gonna first mark um, the systolic direction, duration um, by finding the beginning of the QRS down here, then taking your calipers in time to mark over to the end of ejection. And this is a good example, actually, kind of a fluffy um, um, ejection. You can see that I stopped right here, right before this stuff above the line, even though there's kind of a triangle that looks like it might be like real out here. That's not, we need to stop it right when we saw the stuff above the line. So that's our duration in systole, 214 milliseconds. So now you're going to go over, oh, sorry, there you go. Now you're going to go over to your um, PDA Doppler and you're going to mark here at the beginning of the QRS, the same spot. And then you just march over to what you found on the previous slide, 214 milliseconds, make a note of it, and then add in um, your duration of time that's just the right to left portion within those two lines to get your duration in systole. And remember, um, if that's over 60%, then you qualify that baby as super systemic full. Okay, so we made it through all the measurements. We talked about benefits of standardization, our protocol at Iowa. We went through lots and lots of measurements and some tips along the way. I think um, some of the key takeaways we hope that you have from this lecture um, are hopefully at first, probably just a reminder to everyone that excellent images are really, really important and the foundation of these measurements and needed to go forward. Um, practice and repetition is certainly the key to get good at these me measurements and don't despair at the beginning. It's really normal to take some time to get good at these. Um, follow the shades of gray. Your eye truly will improve over time. Um, and you'll learn how to better deal with and accurately measure even in, in times of lots of variability. Um, I would say overall more is usually more. Averaging is your friend, repeated images if you don't get good values and just it takes practice. And we'll end there and thank you all for attending and, and pause for any questions. Great, thanks uh, Rachel and Amy for covering this really, really broad, but again, really foundations, uh, one of the really foundations topics. Um, I am actually going to ask um first the first question if that's okay so